Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our guest today is Dan Eikenson, director of Cato's Herbert A. Stiefel Center for Trade Policy Studies. Free traders often tell us that trade is good because it creates wealth. And I mean we can see how like manufacturing creates wealth. We had things and they turned into better stuff, right? And and people were employed in this. But how does trade create wealth? Well, trade by expanding the size of the market uh, enables people to specialize, to focus on a division of labor that was unattainable before trade was available to, to increase the size of the market. Uh, the economies of scale that enable producers to continue to produce more and achieve a, a reduced cost of production, unit cost of production, uh, enables tr- com- countries, individuals, companies to uh, exchange what they can produce more efficiently for things that they're less efficient at producing. So there's this idea of comparative advantage, which was um, kind of fleshed out by David Ricardo. Um, so the classical economists started talking about uh, exchange and trying to demonstrate how we can benefit by trade. And Ricardo pointed out that you know Portugal uh, might have an absolute advantage in producing wine uh, and might also have an absolute advantage in producing cloth. So this means Portugal is – better at producing wine than England and also better at producing cloth than England. Correct. But uh, because Portugal was relatively better at producing wine than cloth and England was relatively better at producing cloth than wine, uh, it would make sense for them each to focus on what they could produce more efficiently, uh, maximize production and exchange their surpluses. So that is how you create wealth. That is how you expand the size of uh, of the market. Now, at the time that uh, like Ricardo was writing, and also, of course, Adam Smith was really interested in the wealth of nations and trade. Um, there was a really different theories of what was called mercantilism uh, type of theories of how go- uh, governments and nations were supposed to interact. What is mercantilism? What was the kind of trade theories that they were doing back sure. then? So, mercantilism was commercial theory at the time. The businesses at the time uh, thought that it made sense to. Uh, obtain a, a trade surplus to export more than you import, because by doing that you obtain specie from your your, your trading partners. Uh, you build up your gold and silver reserves. Uh, and Adam Smith uh, pointed out that that is not how you create wealth uh, in, in among nations. That there were there was a better formula for um, for maximizing the wealth of of, of countries, and that was to specialize and uh, take advantage of this division of labor uh, and exchange. And uh, really, he there, there were attempts to address the mercantilist arguments during the 16th and 17th centuries that sort of fell short. Uh, but he really did a, a, a very good job of it. And, you know, th- there were challenges to his, his notion that, 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 that free trade was the way to go to maximize the wealth of nations. Challenges from the classical economists over time, um, uh, ideas of infant industries, uh, actually protecting infant industries might be a good idea. That came from John Stuart Mill, uh, that you could actually use tariffs effectively to uh, improve the terms of trade. But none of these objections have really stuck. So theoretically, I mean the case for free trade I think was won uh, with the Wealth of Nations in 1776. That said, when trade policy seems not to really heed <laughs> heed those facts, uh, it seems to be the gospel of trade policy around the world really remains mercantilism. That is one of the things that strikes me as weird about the way that we talk about trade and the, the policies and the way that politicians address it because this issue – so this issue of specialization is good. I mean we all – we all recognize that in our day-to-day lives, right? Like we all kind of recognize that the person who tries to do everything, like you, you fix your own car and you grow your own vegetables and I mean – Make your own toaster from scratch right. by smelting the metal down. Heal and your own that, injuries that too, and try yes. to cure your own illnesses. Like that, that 
th- those are the kinds of people who are poorer, right? And we, we all recognize now they that would they, survive the zombie apocalypse, though. Right. But, but they, that, but they're, they're, they're the richer they're people are the ones who are really good at one thing and get paid a lot to do it, and then they buy the other things they need. And we all get that. There's very few people who would argue the contrary, except for maybe some people in Brooklyn right now, um, <laughs> the, but, the Unibomber. and Portland, yeah, yeah and the Unibomber. But, yes. but when you make those exact same arguments, and we we do the same thing about like states in the U.S. Like no one, no one's like it would be. It's bad that you know. California seems to specialize in high tech industries. They ought to also specialize in everything else. Like we don't we don't make those arguments. But suddenly, when you're talking about national borders, people seem to forget this. Yes. No, I think that's right. I mean, uh, you know, what's what's prudent on behalf of a family should be prudent in the pursuit of a great kingdom, or however that uh, that, that that quote goes. Uh, what happens is we recognize on a daily basis that we specialize. You guys come to work, focus on what you're good at. I come to work, focus what I'm okay at, <laughs> and uh, uh, and I get paid for that. And and so in exchange, I'm trading with the rest of the economy for the things, the necessities that I need, as well as the luxuries. What happens, I think, is there is this perception when it comes to national boundaries that the rules no longer apply. Aaron, you mentioned you know over people don't think you should have trade barriers between states, and you know the Constitution forbids it. But when it comes to trading at an international level, this mentality of us versus them really takes hold. Uh, and the, the thought is, you know, exports are our national points. Uh, imports are the foreign team's points. The, the goal of trade is to achieve a surplus. Uh, we have a trade deficit in the United States. That means that we're losing a trade. And often uh, we're losing a trade because the foreigners are, are cheating. So that's a very mercantilist expression of uh, purpose of trade. It's, it's very misguided. The purpose of trade is to expand the wealth of nations. Uh, and uh, we, we know that, but we, we, we're, we're inconsistent, I think, as a country, and we fall prey to those trying to uh, steer policy toward, toward their benefit. And, and, and that's why we – that's why protectionism persists in the United States. That's why we have so-called free trade agreements that really aren't about free trade. Uh, they're about managed trade. And we can get into you know, whether or not I think these are good or bad. Uh, it, it depends. But uh, I, I just think that there is this tribal mentality that, that takes hold when we're talking about trade at the international level. Now, you mentioned the, the, the surplus and the deficits, and that's probably the single most common uh, – watchword, what phrase that comes up in free trade and, oh, we have a trade deficit, oh, we have a trade surplus. Can you go a little bit more – what exactly those are and, then, and, and whether or not they're – one of them is good and one of them is bad or sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad or should we always try and have surpluses or, or what's the right way to look at that, that problem? Yeah, I, 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 it's, it's an accounting identity. I don't think it matters at all. Uh, there has been a lot of debate in the United States in particular recently about – whether our trade deficit is dragging down growth, whether it's sustainable in the long run. Uh, we have had a trade deficit for 40 straight years. And what that means is that we, the value of our imports exceeds the value of our exports. So we are buying more goods and services from foreigners than we are selling uh, to goods and services to foreigners. But the flip the, the, that, that comprises the trade account, slightly broader um, – Manifestation of that is the current account. Uh, that that includes um, remittances sent back and forth and profits on investments. You mean remittances like uh, in immigrants sending things back to their families in exactly. Mexico or things like that? Exactly. So we have a we have a deficit, but we have a capital account surplus. So when we buy more goods and services from foreigners than they buy from us, they are investing more in the United States than we are Americans are investing abroad. And as a result, there's no leakage. Uh, protectionists, those con- th- that express uh, profound concern about the deficit, point out that uh, this uh, tr- trade deficits uh, impede job creation and, and, and slow economic growth. But the fact is that those dollars come back to the United States in the form of direct investment in factories, equity investment, purchases of U.S. government debt, which is probably the least efficient form of of foreign investment in the United States, but it does undergird economic activity. It does uh, support jobs. So it doesn't matter uh, to me whether we run a trade deficit. So uh, I think entirely too much is made of it. It shouldn't be an objective of trade, but 
But you'll hear both sides in the current trade policy debate. When I mean both sides, I mean the pro-trade agreement side, the business community, the anti-trade agreement side, the labor and environmental community, citing the trade statistics as evidence that we should or should not pursue these new trade agreements. And it's really mindless. You said that trade creates jobs, but it also – I mean it clearly does destroy – a lot of jobs, right? Like there used to be more manufacturing of certain types in the United States. We constantly hear, you know, shipping jobs overseas, outsourcing. Is that something we should be concerned about? Is that, I mean, does that cut against the the glories of free trade that it's putting all these people out of work? Or, or to uh, add on to that too, it, it would have to be the case that I mean, there are specific people. We talk about jobs in the big abstract, but there have to be specific people who lose yeah. from free trade. It, well, uh, tr trade is a factor in the churn of our economy. Um, yes, there are – there is this creative destruction that is going on. So we are creating jobs and obsoleting jobs at the same time. I, I don't think trade theory speaks to a capacity to create or destroy jobs on net. Uh, but trade is assumed to create – change the composition of jobs. So – as the economy gets richer, uh, as we specialize in more high-value-added activities, um, then the jobs should be shifting in, 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 the, in those directions. We, we no longer produce garments and clothing. We have far fewer people producing steel. Um, Labor-intensive industries have been uh, – I wouldn't say seeded, but there are certainly far fewer workers in those industries. The case of manufacturing overall is, a, is an interesting one because the issue gets conflated. Manufacturing in the U.S. is as strong as ever. Uh, it is still, uh, still accounts for most uh, – the, the largest share of global value added. Um, year after year, U.S. manufacturing achieves new records with respect to output, value added, revenues, often profits, return on investment, except when we go into recessions, cyclical recessions. But – We've been trending in that direction for, for, for forever. When people complain about manufacturing, they're complaining about the loss of manufacturing jobs. And, and manufacturing jobs peaked in the United States in 1979 at 19.4 million and they've been on a, on a downward trajectory since. Manufacturing as a share of the U.S. economy peaked in uh, 1953 at about 28 percent. Uh, it's now down to about 12 percent. Um, that doesn't matter. In absolute terms, manufacturing is still growing. The reason it's shrunk as a share of the economy is because the rest of the economy has grown faster. The services sector have grown. So um, trade like technology and, and other factors uh, perhaps you know, expedite the, the shift, the shifting in jobs uh, within the economy. But you don't hear too many people asking uh, to put a moratorium on Apple products and on – you know, technology in general, uh, it, it's widely perceived as good for us, uh, as is trade. They both create a larger pie. The question of how we divide that pie uh, is is not a bird. Trade is not to be burdened with that with that question. I think I think it's a matter of different. It's a, it's a matter for other areas of policy. But shouldn't we worry about the fact that we don't make anything here anymore? In the sense that there were you know, good union stable jobs that could provide blue-collar expectations. We're building American cars that manufacturers no longer exist or are owned by fiat and things like that. And there were this huge amount of thing and the blue-collar workers, you know, they didn't have to be ashamed of themselves. They had a good – now they're changing jobs all the time or they're serving tables and we're moving to the service economy, which includes a lot of things that aren't building anything. So everything's built overseas. It all gets shipped back here and we're not building – and if a war starts, we have no ability to – Build things from internally, and so we've just we've created this inequality problem, and all. I mean, is, is that something we should be worried about? Are, do you really believe that? Are you? Are you you're, 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 I think you're, you're, you're trying you're, to get me fired. You're, 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 you're perpetuating a fallacy here. Uh, what is the fallacy? Well, we we build lots of stuff here, and again, we 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 account for about twenty two percent of global ma manufacturing value added. So, if we're not making cars and T shirts, what are we making? We're making a lot of. Business to business products. Um, you know, you hear the complaint all the time. You know, it's a cliche. You know, I went to the store and everything says made in China or made in Vietnam, made in Brazil. U.S. manufacturing doesn't make products that you're going to find on the retail store shelves. We don't make sporting equipment and clothing and hand tools anymore. We make pharmaceuticals and chemicals and com components for 
uh, high-tech equipment, airplane parts, technical textiles, um, things like that. It, it requires fewer workers. But to answer your question, Trevor, yes, we, we do need to make sure uh, – we need to have policies that uh, enable the redeployment of people that lose their jobs. We used to be pretty good at it. Um, between the quarter century leading up to the Great Recession, between uh, 1983 and 2007, uh, the trade deficit increased by 15 times or something but around, around that, that number. Imports went through the roof. Uh, yet we, re- we created 1.8 million net new jobs every year. So the economy – and you know, it's, it's a value judgment as to whether or not you know, a high-paying union job – is better than one in the services sector and, and, and there are various degrees of jobs in, 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 in those sectors. Um, the argument has been, oh, these are all you know, hamburger flipping jobs, but, but they really are not. Uh, a few years ago, the average wage in the services sector exceeded the average wage in manufacturing. One of the reasons that we hear that, hey, we, we had all these great high-paying manufacturing jobs in the past is because unions uh, um, <laughs> you know, really stuck it to management, or, or they, they were being paid more than they should, and as a result, that hastened, I think, the demise of, of, of some of these industries. So we should be concerned about having an economy that is able to redeploy workers, but we need to look at what is inhibiting that. And I think you know, we have superfluous regulations. We have the highest corporate tax rate uh, among OECD countries. We have an unsettled immigration policy, unsettled trade policies, energy policy. We, there's stasis here in Washington. I think if policymakers were to be more straightforward and get out of the way, we would see many more channels widening for for job creation. One of the things that gets proposed to address job losses from trade, especially the manufacturing sector, is buy American laws. Are those – well, first, what are those? And are those a good idea? (laughs) Um, No, I don't think they're a good idea. Should it be something – even if it's not a law, should it be something you strive to do? Well, you know, individuals should have a choice of purchasing whatever they want from whomever they want and, you know, whatever their values are, they should be able to to purchase in accordance. Um, but Buy American provisions have been around since, uh, you know, the early 20th century and these so-called local content requirements are, are sort of metastasizing around the world and they're designed to as, – as jobs programs basically um, when – state and local and the federal government spend money written into laws governing how that money is spent are requirements that certain um, um, ingredients, certain components be purchased uh, from from U.S. producers or they have to be U.S. made products. Uh, uh, The Department of Transportation has the most onerous uh, of the Buy American provisions um, where you have you know, all the steel, all of the cement, all of the labor has to be made in the United States, and you can actually divert and, and actually entertain a foreign bid if if the price that the U.S. bidder is um, asking is thirty percent higher. <laughs> so you're you're already committed to a thirty percent loss mm-hmm. uh, in efficiency. Um, states have been adopting these laws. There was a big brouhaha at the end of last year in New Jersey and uh, the New Jersey legislature passed a a very stringent Buy American provision um, that would have excluded from consideration lots of companies, the products of lots of companies that are foreign headquartered but operate here in the United States. And uh, ultimately, Chris Christie vetoed it. Um, But the concern here is because of globalization, uh, it's it's pretty impossible to understand the DNA of a product or a company. You know, what is an American product? What is an American company? When you have cross-border investment and these global supply chains, um, so really all it is 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 a is a sop to unions, and it makes uh, makes it guarantees that taxpayers get a smaller bang for their buck, and uh, and it's it's causing other governments around the world to. Um, to, to emulate us, and that hurts our exporters. So it's, uh, it's not a good idea. It's just, it's just garden variety protectionism. For those people who lose their jobs when industries shift around them or some 
computer manufacturer that used to manufacture computers that in, in Indiana moves to Mexico, or we have the what was it the giant sucking sound right. of that was, was that that Ross Perot's mm-hmm. phrase of all the businesses going to Mexico, and I think. That kind of did happen on some level, I believe. I mean, a lot of, like computers are manufactured there, and a lot of stuff is manufactured. And then someone is left here is like, well, I used to be able to build commu- computers. I used to have this good job. Now I can't, and I'm 55 years old, and I have I have a skill that is now being practiced by people in Mexico who are undercutting me in wages. Should we be helping that person with retraining them, or should we? What should we be? sympathetic to that person? We should be sympathetic to that person for sure. Let let, let me just go back to the the giant sucking sound. Uh, earlier I mentioned the, the job, uh, manufacturing jobs peaking in 1979 at 19.4 million. NAFTA was implemented in 1994 and uh, the first six years of NAFTA we added about 600,000 manufacturing jobs in the United States. And if you listen to the left uh, as it packages its anti-trade agreement narrative, uh, you would think that we lost all these jobs in manufacturing, and we we, we didn't. And I'm not going to say that NAFTA created those those jobs in the United States, but th- the idea that there has been this giant sucking sound isn't doesn't really is isn't supported uh, so much in the data. The, the but sto- it could have shifted the jobs. It, there has been a right. shift. There, there, certainly, there's been a shift. There, there, we've, we've lost jobs. There have been manufacturing job losses all over the world because the same technology that we're be deploying here, which reduces the demand for labor, is, is being deployed elsewhere. But there is this sort of myth that there's this race to the bottom, that we are um, – that investment chases low wages and lacks environmental standards, uh, when in fact – what investors are most concerned about, what Western companies are most concerned about is minimizing the total cost from product conception to consumption all the way through. And by investing in countries where wages are low, that usually means that they're inefficient and then that, it's, that, that the, labor, the labor cost is, is high overall. Uh, they really want – investors are looking for places where the labor skills are suited to the activity that they're intending to do there where access to ports is, is good, access to infrastructure is good, where the risk of asset expropriation is limited. Where Sudden nationalization by Hugo Chavez it, type of situation. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So there, there's lots of uh, – my point is a lot of the factors that weigh into outsourcing decisions uh, weigh in favor of investing in the United States. And in the United States, we have more foreign direct investment than any other country in the world. And our manufacturing sector attracts a uh, trillion dollars of foreign direct investment. So if there were really a race to the bottom, why is there so much investment here in the United States? The, the investments here, wh- one of the factors is it's a pretty large market, skilled workers, relatively uh, secure political climate, economic climate. Um, and when companies invest abroad, you know, instead of there being this um, – you know, people think in their heads of this factory being uh, disassembled in Ohio, bolt for bolt, rafter by rafter, <laughs> and being resurrected in Mexico or China to ex- to produce for export to the United States. The numbers show that 90 percent of the output from foreign invested companies abroad is sold abroad. So it's not shipping jobs abroad to sell back to the United States. That's, that only accounts for a very small um, percentage of it. But to your question was, you know, what should we do about this, the, the people that lose their jobs? Well, we, we have um, something called trade adjustment assistance, which has been a part of our um, trade repertoire since uh, 1962. It is widely considered to be a failure. It, it is a failure. Even Sherrod Brown, a senator from Ohio who's in favor of maintaining protectionist barriers, calls them funeral expenses. <laughs> so so um, it, it doesn't work, but tr- but workers do need to be retrained somehow, and, and, and on whom does the onus fall? Well, the workers, um, manufacturers, or the companies that would, would want to hire them. So I think that there should be some sort of incentive for manufacturers or companies in general to hire people that don't have the skills to, to pay them, to train them, to, to acquire these skills in exchange for their being willing to work for a year or two for them, something like that. Certainly get the government out of, out of this uh, 
process because the government doesn't know what skills are going to be necessary next year or the year after. But isn't it I – mean, to push back a little bit, it, it, if investment in the United States is worth so much, I mean – then why is Nike in Southeast Asia, you know, running sweatshops and chaining people to their their factory lines and expand? I mean, it, you have to admit that the companies go to where the labor is cheap. It and, depends and, and on what you're making, and then exploit the workers. Well, come on. <laughs> well, come on, that's, man, what, I that's mean, the argument. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a common. I'm doing a pretty good impersonation <laughs> of it, but you know, that's the argument. Right. That's the other. I mean, that's yeah. one of the other kind of concerns about free trade. Right. Sure. It's like, yes, it may enrich us, and even if it doesn't destroy American jobs and make America poorer, that we are. From a moral perspective, right, like that that six dollar t shirt that we're buying at Walmart yeah. is, I mean, we're it's buying covered it in the blood of, like, of yeah, children, like yes. these, these exploited children, yeah. and that if we were willing to pay eight dollars or ten dollars, we wouldn't be exploiting poor people, powerless people overseas. Well, I don't know that we're really. I don't think they feel that they're being exploited. I think some uh, certainly there are. Some exceptions. There is, there are sweatshops. There is exploitation. In some cases, that's the exception, not the rule. Though, I think the left likes to paint a picture that this is the manifestation of capitalism, the obvious outcome of capitalism. But uh, people that work in factories in developing countries are usually pretty happy to be working there, as opposed to out in the fields. Um, it's, Farming is very difficult. <laughs> yeah, 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 out in the hot sun. Yeah. And, and you know, I've made this argument before, and. Um, and in fact, I, I, I did one of those point counterpoints in, in some publication, I think the New York Times online or something like that, where the premise was, look what capitalism has wrought. You know, your, uh, the, these Western uh, companies uh, that are exploiting foreign workers. And as I clicked on the internet to, to read the rest of the article, we saw um, – um, not Nike, but you know all these retail brands who are advertising on the New York Times website. They too are benefiting from this. You know, it was uh, exposed in, in, in that little episode. But um, when Western companies invest abroad, they are mindful of the fact they have a brand to protect. And when there's exploitation of workers or the environment, when shoddy products are made, when dog food is uh, in, in infected with poisonous uh, ingredients. That ruins their bottom line. So there is self-interest that is motivating companies to do their due diligence and to, to pick and choose the factories with whom they, they work abroad. They tend also to, to pay higher wages because they want to get the best workers. Um, they, they tend to use uh, mechanisms, uh, production mechanisms that have been tried and true by Western environmental uh, protection agencies, things like that. So they're raising the standards. Uh, and without U U.S. or European or other Western investment in, in, in developing countries, the options, I think, would be much more limited and the process of development would be slowed significantly. Remember, the United States was a developing country at the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. and, and as we got richer, we started creating child labor laws and environmental provisions and things like that. And that's – kind of a luxury good. I know it. Well, the interesting thing is in the United States, if you just follow the garment industry, which is often a, a prototypical sweatshop, it begins in, in earnest in Lowell, Massachusetts, using women in these sort of really interesting company towns where they're, yeah, they're working 12 hours a day, six days a week, but they get a day off. I mean, like they, you never get a day off on the farm. Right? Right. People never, people always complain about child labor, but like Children always work on farms. It yeah. was always industrialized child labor that was the issue, right? They got a day off. They learned to read. And then th and then it became too expensive to employ them in Lowell. So they shut down there, moved to South Carolina, moved around the country, and then eventually went to China. Do we have any really good instances of some of these places where, where because of foreign investment, because of these kind of factories, the, the country is richer – now than it was before? Is there any sort of good causal chain there we can draw that, that they moved on because now there's too much, the labor's too expensive there, so now they're to a different place? And that's what we would want, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, China is an excellent example. Um, there is a lot of reshoring from China to Vietnam and Cambodia. Um, and uh, even, Nick, even Nicholas Kristof uh, has pointed out that we shouldn't disparage apparel cut-and-sew operations in Cambodia where the options confronting young women were picking through garbage dumps, prostitution, uh, and other uh, more difficult uh, 
toils. Um, so, yes, we're seeing countries get richer uh, as a result of this. And, you know, you say it started in Massachusetts. It started in uh, Manchester, really. Really, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Manchester, then to, then to New England, and then from New England to South Carolina, and South Carolina to China, China to Vietnam and Cambodia. Um, so there is a, there's a process here. And, uh, you know, what, what, what's very different, Today, from when the United States was coming online, and you know, and when you know, when Adam Smith was writing, and the classic economists were writing in the 19th century, is this is getting back to the comparative advantage thing. It's no longer about exchanging wine and, and cloth. It's not specializing in production of a particular product. It's specializing in a function on a, on the supply chain. And right now, the United States is at, still at the, is at the top of the global value chain. Um, you know, Germany and Japan are great at precision manufacturing. You've got countries that are very good at mid-level manufacturing like China and assembly operations. And that's where the specialization happens. You see a lot of jobs on the supply chain going accordingly and respectively to these, these countries. It's not static. And uh, you, you need to have good policies to stay or to get to the top or to stay there. And we are having this global competition right now for investment and and – it's really a competition of policies, and I think it's a great thing. Globalization is putting every government's policies on trial the way federalism was supposed to among the states. What about the argument – and this is one when we post stuff about trade on, say, libertarianism.org's Facebook page and we get comments from our readers that are along the lines of, yeah, free trade between nations is great in theory um, or it's great if everyone plays fair. But when other countries do things like manipulate their currency or – Take away know, their environmental take protections. Away their, yeah, environmental protections, things like that that gives them a unfair advantage. Don't give labor rights. There's a good one, yeah. That that, that sort of thing is not just bad for the people in that country um, that the policies may be harming, say, but that it, it somehow makes the trade worse for us as well. Yeah. Uh, I think in most cases, you're looking for you're, you're, we're looking at excuses for reacting and, and, and imposing some sort of a countervailing tariff uh, to mitigate the alleged benefit that that is accruing. The problem with analysis of trade is that it's it does seem to focus commonly at at the national level. Like this policy is good for the United States. We need to do something about Chinese currency manipulation because. It acts as a subsidy for Chinese exports and a tax on on imports, so that hurts U.S. exporters. And is that true? More or less, that that yeah, you could you, we could say that. Um, however, tons of Americans benefit from Chinese currency manipulation. U.S. import using uh, industries that rely on imported products from uh, or components from China. Get a discount. Consumers get a discount. Uh, U.S. exporters face a, a, t a tax, more or less, uh, and because of you know if in fact the currency is is undervalued intentionally. Um, but I don't think that's that big of a deal in this particular example that we're talking about. I know Aaron, your question was was broader than that, but in this particular example, because of globalization, products are made in multiple countries, and in China's case, for example. About 50 percent of the value of exports from China is Chinese value added, Chinese components made with Chinese labor and overhead. The other half comes from other countries. So that means that it purchases those components and assembles them in China and exports them. So if the, if the currency is undervalued, it's paying too much for those components. So its cost of production is higher. And if we insist that China raise the value of its currency – then all those components are going to be lower, lower priced, and they're going to be able to reduce their price for export, uh, and which will mitigate entirely the the effect uh, uh, on import competing industries here in the United States. And uh, so, I, I I I think what what is hurtful to certain in, uh, interests is is beneficial to others. We are not just a nation of, of monolithic producers, right? We have so many different. Uh, entities on the, on the supply chain from the consumer up to the producer. And, uh, so, uh, you know, broadly speaking, uh, 
we have tremendous advantages that other countries don't have. So if some countries don't want to enforce their environmental laws or their labor laws. Again, I think it's the exception and not the rule when this happens. We have tremendous advantages here, having the world's largest market, having the most innovative society that the world has ever seen. Why are we innovative? Because we allow competition of ideas. There's no reluctance to criticize somebody's idea. We have access to these capital markets to research institutions. We have the rule of law. We, it's, it, for the most part. <laughs> but we have these huge advantages that uh, are more, much more advantageous than low wages or lax environmental standards. So when you were talking about, uh, just for an example, about the value-addedness of something like it's this very long production line, as you mentioned, that's different now. And you said between the wine and the cloth example, that was all integrated within Portugal and, and England. Now it goes across. So we have an iPod, right? Yeah. What does it say? It says something like – Designed by Apple in California. It, it, manufactured it, it, manufactured exactly. in China. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what it says, yeah. So the value-added is some of the ideas, which we grew – here, I'm putting that in scare quote. Came up with them here, and then, and then, but there are components that aren't all aren't all built in China. They're built in maybe Laos or something. So they, so it's this. You can imagine the entire genesis of an iPod, mm-hmm. beginning in all these different countries, all benefiting from the ideas coming out of Cupertino, and yeah. building up. And where, where is most of the value getting added? Do you have, do you know like an iPod? Well, there's also don't yeah. forget on the other end the retail. Yeah, the retail. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. This this is a become an iconic story in, in, in this globalization debate. I think in 2007, the first study came out. It was, I think, some economists at UCAL, Davis, uh, wanted to figure out the components of an iPod and where where they were made and the contribution to the total value of the product. Since then, there have been you know, kind of tag-on studies, one doing the iPhone, one doing the iPad. But the conclusions are basically the same. I remember the numbers for the iPod approximately – Costs about one hundred and fifty dollars to produce the iPod. Um, most of the components came from Japan, Korea, and Singapore. Some from the U.S. Very few, from, few from China. And it turned out that of that one hundred and fifty dollar cost of production, six dollars was Chinese value added. Um, so when we import that one hundred and fifty dollar iPod from China, it registers as a one hundred and fifty dollar import from China, and it sort of exacerbates our bilateral trade deficit and adds fuel to the fire of our the, – the, the, the deficit debate. But then that iPod is retailed for $300 in the U.S. And that covers um, logistics and advertising. But they're pretty big, big profits for Apple shareholders. Uh, and those profits are – some are returned to the shareholders and some are retained earnings that go into R&D for the next generation of products. But – if the iPod didn't sell for three hundred dollars, if we didn't avail ourselves of uh, labor abroad, and it cost five hundred or six hundred dollars, they never would have been quite so ubiquitous. There wouldn't have been the momentum that spurred all these in- new industries, the app industries, podcasts, the podcasts, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. There you go. and all these accessories. You know the the, the stuff you you know go jogging, the uh, equipment, and, and everything else that's gone with it. So. You know, earlier I said 50 percent of the value of Chinese exports is Chinese value added. In, in the in high tech industries, and I, I consider Apple products high tech, uh, it's much smaller. It's you know in the, in the, in the area of five to ten percent. But you'll hear Americans who you know want to do combat with with China on the trade front say. You know, according to comparative advantage, we should be making the high-tech products, but we have this huge high-tech direct trade deficit. This is exactly what is – how they come to those numbers. It's that through that iPod. You know, only 5, 6, 8 percent of it is Chinese value. The rest of it is from, is from other countries, including the U.S. Shifting gears a bit, one of the organizations that draws a lot of ire from people who are opposed to free trade, people who are opposed to globalization, the ones who march in the streets in Seattle – is the WTO. So what is the WTO? What does it do? It's a, it's a nefarious Illuminati-run organization, correct? <laughs> exactly. So besides that, besides that, yes. Look, it's not just the anti-globalization left that has questions and uh, impugns the WTO. I, I, I get calls from libertarians on this on occasion as well. Um, I, I'm a supporter of the WTO. It is not it doesn't uh, live up to this sort of nefarious uh, definition that we've heard. 
It's not a bunch of faceless bureaucrats and some foreign capital running roughshod over U.S. Uh, third sovereignty. World and, and third world workers, yeah. right? The, basically, the WTO is the embodiment of 50 years of multilateral trade liberalization. So after the Second World War, we started the, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT, which was the U.S. and a bunch of European countries and Cuba. Um, and it was an endeavor that from 1947 until 1994, uh, through eight or nine successive rounds, liberalized trade and reduced tra tariffs ar ar around the world. The last successful round of the GATT was the Uruguay round, which was concluded in 1994, and it created the World Trade Organization. And it said that all of these rules that we've agreed to are, are here, uh, and this organization is going to operate by consensus, and it will be here for a couple of purposes. One, to adjudicate disputes that arise, uh, and also to sort of commit to the idea of further trade liberalization going forward. The WTO doesn't have any sovereignty. Um, it is uh, it is consensus driven when when it, and it has been quite successful in the sense that there have been 480 or so cases brought to the WTO. So if a WTO member feels that a trade partner is violating its obligations under the various WTO agreements, it can initiate a dispute. What kind of things would be violations? Um, raising tariffs, um, um, not implementing your anti-dumping law according to the agreement uh, on anti-dumping at the, at the at the WTO. We'll talk about anti-dumping next. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, but but um, basically, governments have committed to trade liberalization and to and to to operate uh, within a, a set of rules. And when one government feels that uh, it's the, that its rights have been violated because another government has violated those rules, it can bring a case. And the, the process is you you start with a request for consultation. So the U.S. brings a case against China. The first process is U.S. and China will try to talk it through, see if they can resolve it. If they can't, then the U.S. can request formation of a dispute panel. And the dispute panel will then hear the, hear the case. And at the end of, of the process, they don't say, China, you're violating your commitments, do this. Or China, you're violating your commitments, U.S., you can retaliate. All they say is, China is violating Article 2.42 of the Anti-Dumping Agreement, and we recommend – that China bring its uh, measures, rules, regulations into conformity with the agreement. China doesn't have to agree. Uh, the U.S. doesn't have to agree. In fact, the U.S. is out of compliance more than any other member of the WTO. This is something that we don't hear in U.S. discourse very often. Um, so how do we get the U.S. to comply if it hasn't? This is, the, this is the genius of the WTO system. It allows the complainant to to – Ask to to uh, um, withhold concessions, basically to withdraw. I'm sorry, to withdraw its concessions, basically to raise tariffs to compel the United States to change. And the WTO say, okay, you're entitled to do that, but during that period, uh, the U.S. is going to have a debate because the retaliation list is is created by you know China or Europe or whoever the complainant is, and it identifies. Um, um, citrus in Florida, motorcycles in Wisconsin, textiles in, in North Carolina as the likely victims of, of this retaliatory tariff. And the retaliatory tariff is in place, say, because there's a steel, a steel tariff in place. That was the offense. What this does is it causes the United States to have a conversation within itself. So, so all the industries get together and say, hey, this is, what we're gonna, this is going to be the cost of our failure to comply with the WTO's uh, reasoning. So it's not telling the United States what to do, but it, it incites the United States. It's a catalyst for the U.S. to have this conversation and sort out what its priorities are. And it's worked uh, reasonably well. A lot of people think that the WTO is, is issuing dictums uh, that need to be heeded uh, or else. That is far from the truth. And, and I think of all the international economic organizations, it is uh, the least intrusive actually and, and has worked the best. Now we talked about going uh, dumping, uh, which is something you know a lot about. Uh, what is dumping, and is it 
is it a real thing? Is it one thing? And and is it a problem? I guess if yes, then is it a problem? Right. Well, it's not a problem. Um, you know, there's no real rationale for a dumping law. We, 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 well, yeah, we, well, what is the idea? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, the definition today is uh, uh, the sale of a product in a foreign market at a price lower than normal value or at a price lower than what you would charge uh, in your home market. So it's, 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 it's price discrimination basically. So under U.S. law, uh, a foreign company uh, is dumping if it is selling its widget in the United States at a price lower than it charges in its own market. What, is there anything wrong with that? I mean, price discrimination happens all the time, every yeah, well, day. I don't know why it would cost the same at all. Well, but we – this comes up – so you could analogize this. The concern, I think, if you analogize it to companies operating within the U.S., you know, there's this fear like chain stores versus independent stores, right? Predatory that, you know, pricing. Yeah, predatory – so you, you've got the mom and pop music store right. and then – the big chain store comes in, sets up a outlet, and then can price its stuff because it's it's you know nationwide and getting money from other sources and whatever can price the CDs in its store at a loss at even, a loss yeah. even and drive the mom and pop out of business. And then once it's done that, it can you know cackle gleefully and jack its prices back up. And now we're all paying too much and we've been screwed. Right. Now that's that is the textbook argument for those in favor of having a dumping law, that through predatory practices, uh, the foreigners drive the U.S. Out of, companies out of business and then they raise prices. So it's a pro-consumer law. That's, that's the argument. But really the rationale and, – and we, we've tried to get to the bottom of this and the best we can figure – the rationale is if a foreign company is selling at a lower price in the U.S. than it is at home, um, that must reflect some uh, – uneconomic or distorting policies uh, in, in the home market. The, the company operates as a monopoly or it's protected from competition, something that ena enables it to reap super normal profits at home to sell so cheaply abroad. The fact is, in a dumping investigation, that question is never even entertained. They don't examine whether that is going on. All they do is look to see whether the price is lower in, in the United States than it is in the home market. Of course, there are a bunch of adjustments. You're, you're actually comparing X factory prices. Of course, you'd expect the prices to be different because of movement expenses and selling expenses, et cetera. Um, but the idea is to the – commerce, the Commerce Department calculates the percentage by which the U.S. price is lower than the home market price on average for all the products and then say it's 10 percent underselling, then a 10 percent duty would be imposed on future imports uh, of that product. But to get dumping, uh, to get a dumping order imposed, the domestic industry has to demonstrate that it's been materially injured and that case is made at the U.S. International Trade Commission where they, they show, hey, we've, we've lost revenues or profits, our capacity utilization rate has gone down, we've laid people off. Um, and they have to demonstrate that the cause of that injury is less than fair value imports. Um, that seems like a really attenuated thing, a difficult thing to show even if it was true. Well, the, the, the Commerce Department looks at the, the dumping side, looks at the uh, whether or not uh, – at the dumping margins and the, the International Trade Commission looks at the question of injury. Commerce almost always finds dumping margins and they have a variety of um, – uh, procedures and methodologies that they use in order to skew the comparison. And I've gone into this in, in detail in some of the papers that I've written. I won't bore you guys with it here. But um, the, the what I find to be the biggest problem with the dumping law is that its, it's rhetoric is appealing to politicians. It's, it's to protect upstanding Norman Rockwell type American businesses, <laughs> you know, from these predatory foreigners. Uh, when in, and to save jobs and to level the playing field. But in fact, most anti-dumping cases nowadays for the, since the turn of the millennia, millennium was uh, – are, are on imported intermediate goods. So what happens is that a domestic monopolist, a domestic producer of um, you know, magnesium can bring a case against foreign producers – thereby depriving all the U.S. users of magnesium, like the magnesium auto parts industry, of alternative sources. 
Uh, and so it, they're just using it to keep out competition. Yeah, they're using it to keep out competition. It's 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 just a, a ruse. This whole protecting American businesses. It's U.S. businesses going after other U.S. businesses. The the, the, the one of the worst cases happened in the mid two thousands on Chinese wooden bedroom furniture. The, peti- the petitioners in this case were the North Carolina industry, and they were really going after the Virginia industry. Because the Virginia industry was heavily invested in China. Uh, the North Carolina industry was heavily invested in, I think, Indonesia. And so they brought a, a dumping case against China to cut off the <laughs> – to, you know, impair their Virginia competitors. Most cases are actually U.S. companies inflicting uh, – doing battle against other U.S. companies. This has been written on the – this has been on the books for, for a number of years. Congress is – Unlikely to change uh, change the law, but if you're, com- you're compared about U.S. companies competing in the glo- glo- global economy, if you're concerned about that, you need to recognize that you're raising their costs of production. The downstream companies don't have any standing in these proceedings, and the International Trade Commission does not evaluate the impact on downstream industries when it does its analysis. It just, if the producer wants relief and wins it, uh, and, and can demonstrate these very very basic, e- easy to reach hurdles. Um, they get it. They get it. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, GATT, which it seemed like you're generally a fan of. Um, but then you also mentioned NAFTA, which which you said was not a free trade agreement, was a managed trade agreement. And there are some libertarians, and Ron Paul, supposed NAFTA in that way. Um, what What is that distinction? Uh, is NAFTA something we should be for as the lesser of two evils? And what is that distinction between free trade and managed trade? Sure. Well, um, I've – like I said, I, I, I get a lot of hate mail from the left, but I also get similar toned uh, emails from libertarians. Um, and I, it's a legitimate question. Should, should free traders support free trade agreements? The GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, yeah, it's, a, it's an agreement, but it's, it's a multilateral agreement. NAFTA is a trade agreement between three countries, so it's, it's more narrowly focused. Um, uh, but let, let, me, let me answer your question this way. Uh, free trade agreements are not Adam Smith's – the manifestation of Adam Smith's ideas. Mm-hmm. Free trade agreements are – really reflect businesses' priorities. Right? Business leads the charge. It's about opening foreign markets and using our markets as leverage. Uh, we will only open our domestic market if you open your foreign market. Now, who, who does that benefit? That benefits U.S. exporters. So U.S. consuming industries and U.S. consumers are just along for the ride. Um, shaping the, the pursuit of these free trade agreements is other interests like labor and environmental groups and things like that. My view is that trade liberalization achieved through trade agreements is still good. Consumers, we benefit residually. But our objectives are not driving the push. But we benefit when trade barriers come down here in the United States and, and so we should be thankful for that. The, the problem I have with some of these agreements is that they have protectionism sort of baked into them, uh, these managed trade agreements. So for the, the, the most recent agreement, the, 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 the topical agreement is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which the left calls NAFTA on steroids. <laughs> they're just <laughs> – They uh, love those, those buzzwords. Yeah, they're very, they yes. They like to engage in a bit of hyperbole. Um, but in this agreement – we, there, we will not liberalize our rules of origin with respect to apparel and textile and apparel sales. Uh, it, it, it is likely going to take 25 years to eliminate our 20 our, our 2.5 percent tariff on automobile imports and our 25 percent tariff on trucks. So, in other words, we are we are we are consenting to allow the government to be gatekeepers. Uh, through these agreements, and we are consenting to allow U.S. companies to still have access to protection. We, we also have uh, these um, uh, pretty pretty uh, trumped up intellectual property uh, rules that we're pursuing. We have in, in IP rules, patent and copyright rules here in the U.S. that we are supercharging in this agreement, it seems. You know, the, the terms of the agreement are, have not been released yet. Uh, some, some, some information has been leaked. We'll see. There is also uh, uh, what I would consider to be protectionism in the form of this, something called the investor state dispute settlement uh, mechanism. So because business – this is a business wish list. 
uh, and you know, business isn't always acting in the best interest of consumers. We have to keep our eyes on it. So we're going to evaluate the TPP when it comes out and sort of score it. And if it's net liberalizing, we're going to point out the flaws and and say, you know, we we support it or we don't support it because of because of what we find. It's got to be net liberalizing, but we will identify the flaws in it. How optimistic are you about the future of free trade? You know, there are always going to be interests uh, trying to make special cases, special exceptions to free trade. Um, in the United States, tariffs are r- relatively low, about 1.5% on average. We have tariff peaks in certain products, and I think that we will continue to, to bring those peaks down, and I think we will liberalize. And I think the rest of the world will too because – In order to compete in the global economy, you need to be part of these global supply chains and you need to get rid of frictions and impediments. You're competing with other countries and I think – so I I think that bodes well for for freer trade. Um, And it's also a good recipe for for foreign relations. Um, The more interdependent economies are, uh, the the higher the cost of – potential conflagration if it ever comes to yeah, that. Yeah, you don't bomb your own stuff. I you, you, really, you don't bomb your own stuff. And in fact, you know, there's this, this, this transatlantic, uh, transatlantic trade and investment partnership, which is, which is on, on deck after the TPP. And in the Balkan states of the EU very much want that to come to fruition because they want U.S. investment in Estonia and Lithuania and Latvia because they figure that that would, that would uh, be a buffer uh, against any aggression from Putin. So... But you know the context of trade uh, can really be used to facilitate uh, a long-term relationship between the United States and China. There's a lot of contemplation about wh- what direction that's heading headed in. Some people think it's inevitable that there's going to be uh, you know uh, hostilities at some point. But the more you know, it's just the negative aspects of the relationship that, that get the most attention. There are actually a lot, lots of uh, beneficial aspects that that. It doesn't bleed, so it doesn't so it doesn't lead. Um, but I think the more investment, cross border investment, there is between the United States and China, the more we become dependent on each other through our supply chains, the less likely there will be uh, hostilities between us. There's another school of thought, of course, that you know, uh, proactively some governments will say, see themselves becoming too dependent in that inter- interdependence, and then preliminarily or proact- prophylactically do something aggressive. Uh, In fact, we're having a book forum on that uh, soon. I think Justin Logan (laughs) is hosting that. Um, But I think uh, expanding free trade uh, is a good tonic for um, quelling the, the, the tendency toward hostilities. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts, P-O-D. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.